Okay, let's talk about the parts that make up a Blackboard course, both in terms of what's where and how to refer to them. Um, and if you can forgive me the pun on my own name, let's just call this Gray's Anatomy of a Blackboard course. Yeah, um, I know, I know. So why focus on the names for things? Well, just like in, you know, medical science and just about any other field, uh, if you are using the right name to refer to things, it makes it very clear to people what you're talking about and diminishes confusion and just generally puts everyone on the same wavelength. So, about the names of parts in Blackboard. Uh, first of all, there's we're going to talk about the things that are outside of a course. Uh, that would be like the different tabs and the modules to get into courses. Um, then we're going to talk about navigating around inside a course, uh, mostly through use of something called the breadcrumb trail. And navigation between courses, there's a special tool that lets you hop right from one to another. And we're going to spend some time on the home page, which is the default location that people see in your course unless you go change it to something else. And we're going to talk about content areas, which is where most of the things in your course will show up. In addition to that, we'll talk about the controls and tools that are usually down the left-hand side of the screen. And a little bit about the grading tool, how to add it so that students can see their grades, how, to, um, how it doesn't work for instructors. You'll see when we get to it. So these are the things that you're going to be learning terminology for and also where they are. Now we are going to go into most of the how-to's on these components later on in the workshop, but for now, let's just focus on learning the correct names for things. Okay, so here we are, just ready to log into the, in this case, the Blackboard Sandbox environment, and notice that I'm using my instructor account based on first initial last name. Uh, when you log in, the very first thing you'll see is what's generically referred to as the institution tab. Uh, in this particular example, named BB Sandbox because this is our sandbox environment. Um, these different modules on this tab are things that can be rearranged. Uh, the default position that they're in is probably not what you have to keep it with. So you might be able to move things around if you want to prioritize where something is. Chances are, though, uh, that any Blackboard system, particularly here at Palomar, is going to have a My Courses module, typically in the upper right corner of the screen. And that's going to give a listing of all of the courses that you have access to, unless you change its configuration. Uh, it's actually something you can manage and trim down the number of courses that are on. Um, assuming that you are both instructing in some and taking other courses as a student, you'll see two different areas. In my case, I only have the one, courses where I'm an instructor. If I was enrolled in any courses as a student, I would see an entry for courses where you are student and that would actually be below. So the instructor listing is always above in the My Courses list. Um, again, that's unless you go in and customize it to do something different. Uh, also of interest is uh, up here next to the Institution tab, there's a Courses tab. And on there, a couple of things to point out. Number one is that there's another module that has courses listed on it. Uh, in this case, it's called the Course List. That's a completely separate configuration from the My Courses module on the default tab. Um, so in this case, even though it's the same account, I see different courses here because I turned some of them off on the first tab and not on this one, depending on which ones I want to access. Um, then there's also access to the course catalog in Blackboard. Now, most of the time, that's not something people go to visit. Uh, however, in the case of this sandbox environment, you've all had experience going in here because this is where you went to go into the AT training area and actually self-enroll into the workshop course that you're in right now. Uh, okay, enough said about that. 
Um, so there's the institutional tab on our production system here. It just says My Palomar. There's a courses tab, and then you shouldn't see anything else, although since I have superpowers on the system, I see some administrative stuff as well. Um, so, in a nutshell, that's the stuff that is important outside of a course. The next step in uh, doing just about anything in Blackboard is to go into a course, and almost all of the courses that I have access to are still listed as being unavailable, but if I just click a name, I'll hop right into a course. Well, with the introduction of uh, Service Pack 8 to Blackboard Learn, we've got some new functionality in the system that uh, is kind of hidden here and there in the courses, but uh, one of the things that's actually quite nice is Blackboard is now including, uh, turned on by default, the uh, what they call the Quick Setup Guide for instructors first entering a course. Now, let me reassure you that when students go into a course, even if the Quick Setup Guide is on, they're just going to see the same course that they're used to seeing, however you have it set up. But when an instructor goes into a course for the very first time, uh, you'll see this guide pop up by default, and it has access to some of the new functionality and uh, things kind of aggregated that you might care about the first time into a course. Now the first screen that shows up has some help information. There's information about using Blackboard. This is all links to Blackboard generated resources, including their whole on-demand learning center with, you know, videos and documents and things to help you. Uh, but then also we have a link to the uh, Palomar Blackboard support right there on that screen. So if you come into a course and then you can't really remember what it was you wanted to do and you need help, you can just hit this link and, and get help from us. Okay, so the very first thing I want to tell you is this box will pop up the first time you go in as an instructor in your course, and it will keep popping up every time you go into your course until you check this box down here in the lower left corner that says Hide Quick Setup Guide When I Enter This Course. Okay, Now, you're going to be tempted to do that the first time into the course and then never come back and look at it. That might not be a good idea, as you'll see in a little bit, but if you wanted to, you could check that box, say apply changes, and then when you leave the course and go back in again, that quick setup guide's not going to show up for you. Now you can manually bring it back on the customization menu. Here's the quick setup guide again, and it just comes back. Um, so again, I, I mentioned this first screen has help resources. There have been two new uh, instructor abilities granted for courses called Course Themes and Course Structures, which not this but another uh, entry we'll, we'll talk about in more detail. Um, but the Course Themes can all be controlled from right here on the Quick Setup Guide, and that's basically abilities to, to choose a, a theme uh, colors and patterns and styles for your course. Again, more on that elsewhere. And then the course structure, uh, this is a quick way to choose between the different uh, structural samples that Blackboard has begun including. Now they don't show up in your course by default, so this is something you'd have to manually opt into. But through the years, we've had faculty say, can't you give me some samples of a course that I could tear apart and rebuild the way I want? Well, now Blackboard gives you exactly that based upon a whole bunch of different concepts, uh, activity-based, communication-based, content-based, which is probably how most courses are arranged right now in my experience. Um, and then even if you're used to some other system's way of doing it, maybe you came from a, uh, an angel background, uh, you might want to change over to that sort of a structure because it'll feel more familiar, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, that's all nested away under course structure. The colorful stuff is under course themes, and the default screen gives you some help information and a link straight to support. So that is the quick setup guide. And then whenever you check that box and say apply changes, it'll get out of your way. It'll let you work in the course, but you can always get it back again right off of the customization menu. All right. Uh, one of the 
new options in Blackboard these days is uh, something called course themes. Now first of all let me show you from the quick setup guide that you'll see the first time you go into one of your courses you can actually choose among a number of the uh, course themes that are already there um, but even once you've cleared out of that if you want to get back to choosing a new course theme it is extremely easy when you are an instructor in the course you have of course your switch for edit mode up here in the upper right corner of the screen and right next to it is a menu that looks kind of like a bunch of little paint swatches point at that and it'll open up a massive menu to allow you to change the course theme now by default you get the theme called default <laughs> not a real surprise there uh, but you can explore this menu and see that, well, there's actually quite a number of them. There's some uh, uh, structure to the different course themes of a sort. They say that they have subjects and structural ones and season ones and then design ones and, well, color. Um, but really the best way to take a look at what these course themes are going to do for you is to choose one, like citrus here, which is, well, I guess citrus really is a good word to describe it. Um, so you can see how it looks on a couple of the different screens of your course. Personally, I like looking at a content area by default because that's what most of the stuff in my course is, is a content area thing. Uh, you can even collapse down the menu if you want to get a good look at what the uh, background of the, the screen looks like a little bit. And then you can choose through here. Um, flame, for example. Eh, I don't know if I like that one very much this one I absolutely dislike, but you can see how easy it is to switch between these. And you choose whichever course theme appeals to you, and you can set this individually for each and every one of your courses. And the beauty is, choose the theme and it's applied. There's no other steps to go through, no other customizations to make. So it's just a matter of going onto the menu and picking off whichever entry you want to. Uh, in this case, since we're coming up for a summer semester, let's go to summer and we'll leave you on that beautiful looking oranges and blues and things. Um, so feel free to switch around on your course themes on the new Blackboard. To understand how the course to course navigation in uh, the newest upgrade of Blackboard functions, the easiest thing is to just see it in action. So here I have a list of my courses and I'll go into one of them. In case you haven't seen it before, this is uh, one of the course themes. looks kind of different. Uh, and up here in the upper left corner is the Course to Course Navigation menu. Open that up and you'll see a list of courses, of all of the courses that you have access to as an instructor or as a student. And you can just choose another course and you hop straight from one course to another. So you don't always have to navigate back to the uh, institution panel up there. Now another thing, and where you start seeing real power in this, is if you have similarly named areas in your course. Uh, for example, if you were in the needs grading function and you were grading things, and then you want to jump to another course, well you pick the other course off the list and it takes you straight to that needs grading section in the new course. Uh, this is true of uh, content areas and folder structures that have the same names, but they do have to have the same name across the different courses. If instead I go into a content area, like in this course it's called Getting Started, and I choose to go to a different course, like this uh, online education training one, the POET course, that doesn't have the same name, it takes me to the default course entry point instead. So, worst case scenario, you're going to jump into the entry point for a new course rather than the same area if there is no corresponding area from where you jumped from. Uh, but again, on all of the course tools, especially the grading functions, those are valid across multiple courses, so you'll be able to jump straight between those. So, once you're in your course and you've gotten past that quick setup guide, um, there's a few things of note. Uh, the, in the way of terminology that we can talk about here. Uh, first of all, I'm using the workshop course because I actually have some file structure to look at. And when you move around in a structure, that's when you begin to see the use of this area up here called the breadcrumb trail. Now, believe it or not, 
breadcrumb trail is actually a Hansel and Gretel reference uh, to the children leaving the trail of breadcrumbs behind them in the, uh, down the path so they can find their way back. Because that's what happens as you navigate through a folder structure in the course. The farther you go down folder inside a folder, the more entries show up on the breadcrumb trail. It shows you where you've been, and it lets you get back to where you were. So if you go like eight folders deep, you're going to have a very long trail here, and you can go back to like the five folder deep level pretty easily. Uh, far better than having to navigate back all the way down that structure again. Okay, so that's the breadcrumb trail. Also useful up there is notations on things like whether or not the course is available. Uh, well, actually, it will say this. If it's unavailable, it will not show anything at all if the course is available. So if you do see a note there, you know your students can't get into the course. Um, down the left-hand side of the screen is the course menu and the control panel, and they, they act kind of as one piece. In fact, some instructors who've never been in as a student seem to think that everyone sees both components of this, but it's really two separate chunks. The control panel is everything under this course management area. The course menu is the stuff above it. Okay, You can collapse both of those down. The name of the course is what it would collapse to for the course menu, and then control panel is how everything else would collapse there. Um, there's a couple of different ways that this can trip people up. Uh, first of all, refer to it as the course menu. So you'd add things to a course menu or rearrange your course menu by moving things around. Um, but you can also collapse the course menu in two different ways. The first one that I showed you was just making it collapse upward into this single entry. The other way you can collapse the course menu is the entire sidebar. If you click right here on this area between the course menu and the content area, the whole thing slides to the side. Now, there's a pretty visible blue bar there telling you that there's something going on, and when you point to it, you get this little expanding arrow looking thing. So that'll be a note that you can open it up again, but just be aware that you can collapse that. Sometimes students will collapse it accidentally, um, and then they can, you know, ask us, hey, what's going on? Where'd the course menu go? And we can help them out with that. Uh, alternately, they can just you know, log out of the system and shut down their browser and then come back in and it'll be expanded again by default. Um, but that can be useful at times if you're trying to show off content in front of your students. You might want to just slide the course menu out of the way so it doesn't distract them um, and just focus on whatever's in the content area. All right, that pretty much takes care of the top bar and the left-hand sidebar inside of a course. Uh, next up, let's talk about, well, the, the real place where most of the work goes on in courses is the content areas. And that's what you've been working through in the workshop course. You've viewed videos, you've taken tests, you've navigated through folders that are all in this content area. Adding them to the course menu is a simple thing. You say add content area, give it some name, choose whether or not you want users to see it. Let me show you what happens if you don't check that box. You submit it and it gets a little icon saying it's hidden. If you want to make that available later, you can just choose the context menu for it and say show and it would then begin showing up for them if it had something in there. And you can delete it just as easily. Whenever you delete something in Blackboard, it's going to ask you if you're really sure. When you say OK, it gets rid of it. It's just gone. OK, so bear in mind, <laughs> that's what's going on there. Um, similarly, you uh, possibly have used the course tools linked on the workshop menu already. The two that are there are uh, the student my grade list and the email tool for sending email to the instructor. Uh, if you haven't at least looked in those areas in the workshop course, you might want to do that now just to get a feel for how those tools appear. Um, one thing about the uh, My Grades tool that you'll notice, if you put a link to it, since I'm in as an instructor, it does nothing for me. It just says that I don't have grades because I'm the teacher. Uh, but for students, like you guys are in the workshop course, you'll see an entire table of all of the things that you can be graded on. Um, and if I've scored any of your work yet, you'll see that too. <laughs> okay, so 
that's what goes into this content area of the course and the course tools also show up over in this content zone if you will there's one more specialized course which i'm not using in the workshop course but let me show you how it looks in a sandbox course and all of your production courses are the same way the default entry point is something called the home page now the reason for this is because we wanted to have some area that by default would show up for students because as you may have noticed content areas do not show up for students unless there's something in them okay and if we didn't have something show up by default students would see a beautiful error message if they went into an empty course instead they'll see this home page by default and there's instructions in the workshop course telling you how to change that to something else if you want to but the home page is kind of a dashboard of information uh, if you post announcements this will give kind of a roll-up of the most recent announcements in the course if you're using the tasks that's what this one's going to have listed in it if you're putting calendar entries in uh, they'll show up here in this module at least the next week's worth and for each of these areas you can say more and actually see the full course tool for that so in this case even though this course has no announcements i can click more announcements and it takes me to that announcements tool okay um, the other modules on the home page are a little different uh, two of them matter a lot for students two of them matter a lot for instructors but not students so let's dispose of those two first the ones that are geared towards instructors are the needs attention module and the alerts module okay needs attention is going to tell you things like when things need grading or when there's uh, just something that should be getting your attention you can dismiss things as you go along or with things that need grading as you grade them they disappear from this list if this is not a tool that you want to use you can just turn it off you can always turn it back on again later if you want but students will never get any use out of that similarly with the alerts if you've set up early warning system or due date things this will tell you when students have met the criteria of the early warning rules or not turn something in on time but again the alerts module is only good for instructors so by default probably you'll want to have that turned off for your students because they won't need to see it if you want to use these tools you could set up an entirely different dashboard page just for yourself that has those modules on it that you want to use so the two modules that are good for students the what's new and the to do what's new simply shows a notation for anything that's added since the last time a student has been in the course so if you post some new content students will see that show up in the what's new module if uh, other people post the discussion board and students come in they'll see that there's X number of new posts in the discussion forums and then they can click on those notifications to go straight to whatever the new stuff is so that module can be very useful for a student who wants to stay up to date on the new material in a course um, can also be useful for instructors especially the discussion board aspect of it but it's not as useful as it is for students um, the to-do module, on the other hand, is really useful for students if you are setting due dates on things. Okay? Now, if you're not setting due dates, the to-do module really doesn't do much for your students. Well, anything for your students. <laughs> but what will happen if you are setting due dates on your assignments, on your tests, on even just grade center columns that you add, you can set due dates. This will notify them of which things are going to be due sometime in the future when it starts getting closer when it's immediate when it's today when it's too late to <laughs> turn them in on time those entries will just show up in here automatically and that's really one of the nice things about uh, the home page module in general is it all happens automatically if you're doing things in other parts of the course you post a new announcement it'll just show up here you post new content a reference shows up here you've set due dates on things they start showing up here when the time comes for them to matter okay 
So you don't have to do anything to these modules to make them function. You just have to do your normal work in the course, and then this acts as a roll-up of information about what's going on in the course for the students. And that's the home page. And honestly, by now, I think we've talked through all of the different parts of a course. So you know the outside tabs, the breadcrumb trail, the course menu, the control panel, content areas, modules on the home page. These are the terminology that you'll end up using when you talk to uh, support about things. Of course, you also have the course to course navigation tool, the course themes menu, the edit mode switch. Um, although you'll forgive me if I refer to this as course hopper if we're ever talking. I, find course-to-course -course navigation to sound a little stodgy. Um, <laughs> but these are the parts that make up your Blackboard environment and how to refer to them. So now, should you run into problems, you'll know to tell support that you are having a problem adding a tool link to your course menu instead of being vague and saying, I'm having problems making the thing on the stuff, okay? <laughs> and that is the parts that make up, at least, most of a Blackboard course. Well, one thing that, I mean, there's nothing really to show on the screen here, so you get to look at my ugly mug for a while. But uh, one of the things that sometimes is confusing when people first start looking at the testing abilities in Blackboard is that there's three things where people expect one. Tests, they understand test. I mean, that's, you go in, you take it, you get a grade. Okay. Uh, but then there's surveys. And those are similar to tests, but they uh, function differently after students have taken them. And then there's these things called pools, and that usually confuses the heck out of people. So let me demystify this. Okay. Tests and surveys are very nearly identical with these exceptions. With a test, you not only know who took the test, but what answers they gave, and there are correct answers on all of the questions. I mean, that's the point of a test. So you're also assigning points. Even if it's zero points, you're assigning points in, in some fashion, and there is a right and a wrong answer to each question. Uh, with a survey, although you know who has taken the survey, you do not know what, they, what each individual answered. All you can see from a survey is aggregate res results. So you might see that Bill and Tim and Sally actually took the survey, but one out of three people said B on this question, and you don't know which of the three, and there's no way to tell. Blackboard literally does not store that information. Even with my system administrative superpowers and being able to drill straight into the database, I can't tell. It, the data literally is not there to find, okay? So surveys are anonymous in nature, even though you know who has taken it. Okay. Um, and then pools are not something that a student would ever directly access. A pool, the idea behind it, is it is a, um, a container filled with questions that are going to be used in either tests or surveys. Now this workshop doesn't have you build any tools, or any pools, sorry. Um, <laughs> and in fact, we don't have you build a survey simply because it's such a similar process to building a test that you learn one, you pretty much have a solid grasp of the other one. Um, but let me just give you an inkling through an anecdote of how the pools can work, okay? Because sometimes I'll have faculty who are considering doing testing in Blackboard uh, whether it be, you know, real exam type or just things that are tutorial in nature. And one of the concerns they have is that they don't want to give the same test to all the students. Now, as you'll see, when you get to the building tests area in the course, it's really easy to take a test that has the same questions and produce the questions in random order. And maybe that's good enough. I mean, for something that's tutorial in nature, that's probably okay. You want people to keep rehearsing them, just not necessarily in the same order. But if you're really trying to do a test, the best way is to have each student get at least a slightly different test. So I had this one fella come in and he said, you know, here's what I do in the classroom. And I don't think Blackboard can do this, but you, you let me know. He says, in the classroom, I usually have four or five rows of desks in the room and I don't want students able to look at the students next to them and cheat. Okay. All right, fair enough. Uh, so what he's done is developed five 
variants of each test. Each of his tests had 20 questions, and he came up with, for each question, five variants on uh, whatever it was that he was testing on. And he said that he'd already put in the work to make these questions pretty much equivalent in difficulty. So it didn't matter which row you were sitting in, the test was just as difficult and it covered the same material, but it was different actual questions. So I kind of smiled at him <laughs> and I said Blackboard can not only replicate that in effect, it can go one better. And here's how. And so what we ended up doing for him was, for each of his tests, he set up 20 different question pools, okay? Each one for one of the questions in his test. Each one of those pools had his five questions for that position. So he had a question one pool with his five first questions in it. And then the test pulled one of those at random for the first question on the test. And he thought, oh my gosh, that means I don't just have five tests, I've got and he started trying to calculate out the actual permutations of tests that could be offered. Um, now, I'm sure that's an unusual case. He'd put in a lot of effort ahead of time to prepare all those variants on questions. But uh, if you have that kind of work already invested in your tests, you could simply port it into Blackboard, a laborious process, but still you could, and end up with truly varying tests that are offered to the students. Um, alternately, if you're using material presented by the publisher, maybe your textbook actually comes with question pools already made, uh, then you can produce some fairly complex tests and be reasonably assured that students um, don't end up getting the exact same test questions, even if they went through the test multiple times themselves, let alone if they were trying to you know, crib off of someone else. Um, so if that's a place that you want to go with tests, you might want to check out, um, well, not even just the Evaluating Learning Workshop, but even get in touch with us, because designing um, question pools to go into tests, it gets complex fast. But I just wanted you to know that sort of thing is possible, and that's why there's a pools entry. Uh, in your course tools, you go to test surveys and pools, and so I wanted you to know what each of those three was really for. Uh, but in this workshop, we're only going to focus on the tests area, so no worries about the rest for now. Just keep in mind that it's possible. All right, now it's time to look at the complexity that is the Grade Center, only briefly at this point. All right, for starters, to get here where I see my grade grid, I went to the Grade Center, full Grade Center entry on the control panel. Um, naturally, in your sandbox course, it's far simpler than it will be in your production courses where there's real students because there's only an ent entry there for yourself. Um, these are the default columns that show up in a grade center, uh, including a weighted total and total. Chances are you won't need both of those. And there's some other informational columns that I'll show you how to get rid of when we're talking about really manipulating the grade center. Um, the controls for adding things, individual columns, what they call calculated columns, those are all right up there including the ability to set up like subtotals if you want. Uh, it's really, the Grade Center is versatile, but the counterbalance is that it's complex. So you need to have your eye on exactly what you want to accomplish. If all you're looking for to start out is to just have a place to post columns for the assignments you give your students, for you to put your grades in and for them to see that, that's pretty attainable, and that's what we're going to be tr definitely covering in this workshop. Uh, for the more complex things to do in the Grade Center, that's when you'd probably be looking more towards that evaluating learning workshop. There's also uh, the ability to manage the Grade Center is all showing up in here. Again, really complex stuff that we're not going to go over, and a couple of kind of interesting shiny things that we'll look at as well. Um, as you add more and more columns, eventually you'll end up hopping over to column organization to manipulate the order of things. And when you start getting really fancy in the Grade Center, you might set up some different filtered smart views. Um, ultimately, it might come down to wanting to just have sheets that maybe you even want to print out and hand out to your students on what their grades look like. Now, of course, there's always that My Grades area that they can always go into the course and check, but sometimes it helps to just have paper, and it is possible 
to actually create a report that will give you a page per student of all of their grade listings at a given point. So that's something that is possible to do a little beyond the scope of this workshop because we need to fit everything into a tight time frame. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is the layout of the grade center. Okay. Again, we'll get to the actual manipulation of it a little bit later on. Well, we're almost done with this module. There's only one last thing that's kind of worthy of note, and that's that uh, as I've been working through all these different things and briefly showing how to drop content here and there, you'll notice that the, the course menu and, and the modules on the home page and so forth have gotten kind of cluttered, and sometimes it's nice to be able to just clean things up. Um, for starters, if I want to get rid of entries off the course menu, I alluded to it, but on the context menu for each entry, I can just delete them that way. Uh, of course, it always asks, are you sure if you say OK to delete something, it's gone. So for example, if you deleted a column full of grades in the Grade Center and it said, are you sure you want to delete this, and you said OK, that would mean it's gone. And if you immediately got me on the phone and said, can you please put that back, I wouldn't be able to. That's just the way that Blackboard works. Um, same thing here, if I want to purge out this announcements area, I just get rid of it. If I go into this content area and say I want to get rid of this folder, I can just get rid of that, and it's all just gone. So anywhere that you see this context menu, there's a very good chance that there's going to be a delete choice or possibly a remove choice. And of course, tidying up this home page thing, I made it not be available. I can show it again. and. By virtue of doing that, that's going to be the new default entry point for the course um, because that's the only thing that would be available to students, which I can prove to myself by turning off edit mode and seeing that the menu collapses down to just that one thing. Uh, so that's just kind of tidying up after myself, cleaning up all the baloney. Sometimes that's really useful to do in your sandbox course. Uh, Hopefully you can avoid making a huge catastrophic mess like that while you're working in your production courses later, but it's always possible to just go through and remove things. Just be careful about what you hit delete on because when it's gone, it's gone and that's all there is to it. Okay, so after this, uh, after you've finished watching this video, go ahead and take the test at the end of this module. I imagine you'll do pretty well on it. It's not a tough one, though. Um, and then we're going to move on to uh, something a little more cerebral. I know there's been a lot of talking. The practical is coming, I promise. Um, but we'll be analyzing the class experience after you've taken your test. Okay?